live and ready to begin. So we're going to give you a little resting time or able to see the screen better time. So we're in Hebrews 9. We've got up to Hebrews 9. Uh, we're not going to read all 28 verses. We're going to hit this uh, a little bit slower. But uh, nonetheless, we're up to chapter 9. So we're uh, actually looking at the sanctuary uh, in chapter 9 and dealing with uh, the day of Yom Kippur as we do so. And so it's examining a better sanctuary for the role of the high priest. And so dealing with the ranges of the earthly sanctuaries compared to the heavenly one. The background for our chapter, of course, is Exodus, chapter 25 through 31, and 35 through 40, which outlines uh, how they constructed that ancient sanctuary and all the items that are in it. And uh, we want to note as we go through this that uh, our translators, you can't translate without doing some interpretation. So our translators have put the word covenant in this chapter several times when the word covenant does not exist in the Greek text. And so we want to take note of that when we come to it. And they do that because they believe that it's the new covenant that's under, uh, under discussion here rather uh, than the sanctuary itself, which we'll get to that. Later on in this chapter, it does mention Old and New Covenant, or First and Second Covenant. But at this point in time, the word covenant is not found until we get to verses 15 through 17. And it's not used in the comparative language that he's using as a comparing uh, the earthly tabernacle to the heavenly tabernacle. And that's the terms he is using. And some suggest he's doing that because of the corruption of the temple at the time of Yeshua and at the time before it was destroyed. Well, let's go ahead and read uh, 9, 1 through 28. We're not going to read all of it, but I think, well, maybe I did. Yeah, I did. So we'll read it all, and then we'll come back to the first part. It's always helpful, and so, as you've heard me say many times, uh, words don't have meanings. Paragraphs have meanings. Chapters have meanings. And so you and I use words in very different ways. And so how are they used in the term? Uh, we're not going to know that if we don't read the whole paragraph, whole chapter. So to get the context from a whole chapter is important. So we'll read all of it, and we'll come back. We'll examine the first 11 verses. Now, even when the first had regulations of divine worship in the earthly sanctuary, for there was a tabernacle prepared, the first one, uh, they translate outer one here, but it literally says first one in Greek, in which were the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, the sacred bread. This is called the holy place. Behind the second veil, it doesn't actually mention the first one, but behind the second veil there was a tabernacle, which is called the holy of holies. Having, uh, very interesting the distinction of what he says, having a golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which uh, was a golden jar holding the manna and Aaron's rod which budded in the tables of the covenant, and above it, were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. But of these things we cannot now speak in detail. So he's telling you some of the elements here. And we understand their spiritual significance of the elements here. But he doesn't want to spend time on that. He's rushing on to another point. And we're going to deal with some uh, of the language here a bit. Verse 6, now when these things have been so prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle, first one, performing the divine worship. But into the second, now, why do you use outer and second instead of outer and inward? No, it's just a, a style thing perhaps. But anyway, uh, it's really protos first and second. Only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing which is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience, since they relate only to food and drinks and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. But when Messiah appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater, more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and bulls, but through his own blood he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of 
goats and bulls and ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify. Now listen to that statement. If the blood of goats and bulls and ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify, which they did, for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For this reason, he's the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of one who made it. For a covenant is vowed only when men are dead, for it is never enforced while the one who made it lives. So he's talking about like a will and testament at this point. When we get to verse 18, we'll notice once again, therefore even the first was not inaugurated without blood. He's back to the same subject that he started with. It doesn't, the word covenant doesn't appear here. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the Torah, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood. And according to the Torah, one may almost say, All things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Messiah did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often, as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once, in the consummation of the ages, he's been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after them comes judgment, so Messiah also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. So when he comes back, we're already his. When he comes back, he's not looking at us as sinners, but saints. He comes back looking at us as sons and daughters. And so not in reference to sin. He died for our sins already. Doesn't have to do that again. So let's return to our beginning verse. We're going to break this down slowly. As we continue to acknowledge the superiority of our great high priest Yeshua, the comparison continues between Aharon and Moshiach. Aaron, the high priest, and Messiah, Yeshua, and the place in which they ministered. So the word covenant does not appear. Even the first had regulations of divine worship in the earthly sanctuary. The earthly sanctuary had guidelines. How do we do this? And so the whole point is to picture the necessity of a divine one, sinless one, without blemished one, to come and die for our sins. It is to point us to there's something more than this coming. So since the word of covenant does not appear, rather than plug in a comparison between the first and new covenants, what we would interject is the first priesthood. Because he is our high priest. That's the subject. That's the main subject matter. Messiah, our high priest. Aharon, the first priest. So the following description is the place where the earthly priest would minister. Uh, the priests would be the ones officiating the early temple, earthly temple, carrying out the necessary details in the sanctuary and at the altar as Adonai himself spelled out to Moses in the Torah. Moses didn't decide this. God did. And he did it with a purpose. He did it with an intent. He did it to give us a picture. And so I give you a long note here from Tim Haig. He says, here we begin to see a very interesting parallel. And our author's contrast between Yeshua and the Levitical priests, he's not saying it is a total contrast in differences. No, the active priesthood of Yeshua is in every way foreshadowed and thus made known through the Levitical priesthood. If they presented a sacrifice, so does Yeshua. If they appeared before the Lord to intercede for the people, so does Messiah. If they rendered service to God according to a strict prescribed set of regulations, so does Yeshua. In fact, the contrast between the Levitical and Melchizedekian 
priesthood is not a contrast in kind of activity, but the eternal quality of it. Same kind of activity, but what Yeshua did had, uh, did had eternal consequences rather than simply earthly ones. And so he says the Levitical priesthood was forever to point to the ultimate priestly work of God's own son. The service performed by the Levitical priesthood could never be the object of true saving faith. But Yeshua priest after the order of Melchizedek is the object of saving faith. The Levitical priests offered sacrifices to foreshadow the final sacrifice. They offered incense in anticipation of Yeshua's efficacious intercession. They served in every way as pointing to the ultimate and final work of Yeshua saving his people from their sins in his service for us. So what does that mean exactly? That means that all those who came to that uh, temple in faith and what God provided for them were looking forward uh, to the effectual final consummation in Yeshua. We're told Avraham longed to see Yeshua's day and saw it and was glad. David saw Yeshua's day. How do we know that? Because he wrote Psalm 110 that we've been dealing with in this passage so far already in the book of, of uh, Hebrews. He saw that day. He spoke of that day. And so these people, Moses, well, he was on the mount. If he saw any kind of physical manifestation of God, he saw Yeshua. Came down, his face all aglow. And so, yes, they believed in that one who was coming. We look back to the one who came. They look forward to the one who was coming. So the emphasis at this point in verse 1 basically has to do with an earthly sanctuary. What makes the work of Messiah eternal and able to save forever is that his ministry occurs in a heavenly tabernacle, which is the exact uh, purpose of this chapter. Author will show us a similarity in the ministry of both Aharon and Yeshua and focus on the distinctions as we come to the end of the chapter. The main contrast, again, is where they ministered, not how they ministered. Now he begins to detail something of earthly tabernacle. He doesn't seem to quite get it right. So he says, verses 2 through 5, that there was a tabernacle prepared. The first one, in which were the lampstand, the table, and the sacred bread, that's called the holy place. Behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle, which is called the holy of holies. Having a golden altar of incense, the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding the manna and Aaron's rod, Aharon's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, and above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. But all these things we cannot now speak in detail. He doesn't want to waste time too much on this, but we're going to spend a few minutes on it today. So a general description of the tabernacle, a specific place, an order for the priesthood to function. They didn't function by uh, just going out in the woods and deciding to take an animal and slaughter it. They had a specific way of doing this thing. So Adam and I had Moses construct a sanctuary in which his presence could dwell among his chosen people, Israel. He was already with them when they left Egypt. And I, I want you to build me a place so that's where my presence will be. So they can come and they can get to know me here. And so additionally, he had Moses prepare a place for the worship of God to occur. Uh, the very shape and construction of the tabernacle was to serve as a picture of God and of our approach to God, which he doesn't spend a lot of time on, so I'm not either. It was to reveal us truths about our heavenly high priest, Yeshua, and now he provides a way into the very presence of God. Where was the presence of God? Holy of holies, above the mercy seat. They had daily things they had to do in order for God to remain on that mercy seat and stay close to us. They had once a year thing they had to do in order for God to stay on that mercy seat and stay close to us. And only one got to go in that holy of holies, and so the, pres the way for us to be in that holy presence of God was not yet revealed to us while that tabernacle still stood and was used. So we have the first, the holy place where the great menorah table of showbread was placed, rather than the outer one as the Greek protos, meaning first, and the first part of the holy sanctuary of God, the holy place, he uses first several times rather than outer and will bring us to a comparison not only between the earthly and the heavenly, but between the first and second parts of the sanctuary. Now, two distinct parts. The first used and served daily. The second utilized only on the day of Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. This in and of itself was, uh, will be seen to describe the means by which the lost sinner is saved. 
Our author does not dote on the furniture in the holy place, which assumes knowledge by those to whom he is writing. Now, we spent time back when we were going through the Torah on some of those items and some of its uh, significance spiritually. Um, but that's a time for uh, that would demand time that we don't want to spend here today for another study. Uh, the first is called holy since only the priest could enter the his sacred space. Levites were active in the courtyard. Uh, they were the guardians into the courtyard, but into the holy place they couldn't go. And the Levites actually served, the Levites that were not priests served as a barrier to the people not getting in there. And the priest could go and come. High priest only could go to the second. And so all of these things, they represent um, the light of God, the menorah, his providential care of his people, and the table of the show bread, the bread put out. Uh, most Jewish scholars agree that it was unleavened bread. Unleavened bread probably weighing six, eight pounds by the size of them. Uh, the size of those breads were almost about the size of the top of this little stand I'm using. Huge loaves of unleavened bread. And that was to represent him bringing the manna from heaven as represent his provision for the people. Trust me and I'll provide for you. And then the golden altar of incense. The incense represents the prayers. All these represent the light of God, his providential care of his people, and the importance of prayer. The importance of the second place overshadowed the meanings for the first at this point for our author. So he moves on behind the veil. The veil called the parochet in Hebrew. I don't remember if the first veils use that same term or not at this point in time, but the second veil is, is where we really focus, and that's the veil that separated the holy from the holy of holies, and it's called a parochet. And when Solomon built his temple, that parochet was covered with cherubim, guarding away. And the old story from the Jews are you could take two strong horses back to back, tie the parochet between them, and they couldn't tear it. It was that heavy a uh, uh, material. So he moves on behind this veil. And uh, the two separate spaces in and of itself, an important part of the story of Messiah's death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. But our author doesn't tarry here. Mentions only that which separated the two spaces. Our author will refer to this space as the Holy of Holies in verse 7. But here is simply the tabernacle behind the second veil. A doorway, a veil that separated the holy place from the temple courtyard and the brazen altar sacrifice there and then this second veil that he turns his attention it represents a, ma a major barrier between the two areas the people could come out near the altar the priest could go in the holy place only the high priest could go in the holy holies only once a year a major barrier in these areas so you go from holiness to holiness to holiness you go to a basic level of holiness, to a more intense level of holiness on the priest could go in, and to an ultimate level of holiness on the high priest could go in once a year. Increasing levels of holiness as you made your way to where God was. Now, he seems to most minds have made a mistake with the golden altar of incense. Like the menorah uh, was tended daily by the priests. And we know from reading the Torah, it was placed just outside the Holy of Holies against the parochet right in front where the Ark of the Covenant would have been. And so in Exodus 41 through 5, then Adonai spoke to Moshe, saying, On the first day of the first month, you shall set up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. O tabernacle, O hell, and the tent of meeting. So you shall place the Ark of the Testimony there, and you shall screen the Ark with a veil. You shall bring in the table and arrange what, it, what belongs on it. You shall bring in the lampstand and mount its lamps. Moreover, you shall set the gold altar of incense before the ark of the testimony same word lifne we say appear before god lifne adonai appear before god before his presence and right before that ark of the covenant just outside that veil was where this uh, golden altar of incense was to be placed up and set up for the veil for the doorway to the tabernacle itself that is the first one so the golden altar of incense is closely connected with the ark of the covenant right before it and it's set before the ark, even if it is in the first tabernacle. We see its importance and in, in connection to the mercy seat on the Day of Atonement on Yom Kippur. Coals of fire off that altar. And incense from where that altar lies are taken inside the veil, put on the ground, according to the Jewish scholars, and most agree in the Messianic world, 
to bring a cloud of incense. He couldn't go in there without clouding himself with incense from the presence of God. And the reason why is because no man can look upon God and live. He had to be clouded from that holy presence of God because he wasn't holy enough as our great high priest. And so he had this incense to shelter him. So the, he could only enter within that cloud of incense, shadowing him from the Shekinah, the personal presence of God, upon the mercy seat. The word Shekinah is a rabbinic term. We won't find it in our Bible. But it has to do with Shekinah, to sit, settle, reside. The presence, the residing presence of God in that temple. Leviticus 16, 12 through 13 tells us this story. He shall take a fire pan full of coals of fire from the altar before Adonai. What altar before it? The golden altar of incense before Adonai. It's in, right in front of that puddle cat. And two handfuls of finely ground sweet incense and bring it inside the veil. So clearly it tells us he did this in Leviticus 16. He shall put the incense on the fire before Adonai that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that's on the ark of the testimony. Otherwise, he will die. So he's clouding himself between himself and that presence of God. Now, our author connects the golden altar of incense with the ark, not using the word in, but the word have. So that holy of holies has connected to it. This golden altar of incense, he didn't say it was inside there. He says it has it. Splitting hairs, maybe. It would have been very simple to change the preposition he used there. But it suggests connection rather than location. The Greek term translated here as altar is a word in Greek that actually means fire pan. But most scholars say well, it has to mean the altar, not fire pan. Because fire pans are bronze and this is gold. And so they haven't read their Bible clearly enough, apparently. But the word is correctly translated as censor in the King James Version. And in the New King James Version, it says censor here. A censor of fire pan. There's a big difference between a censor of fire pan and an altar. Some have suggested the censors were of bronze, not of gold. Couldn't be what the author had in mind. However, there were both bronze censors for use on the brazen altar of sacrifice and gold censors for the use on the golden altar of incense. And we have scripture to tell us this. Number 7, 12 through 17. So in number 7, you have all 12 tribes bringing special tools to be used in the tabernacle. So we're only going to read about one of them. Now the one who presented his offering on the first day was Nishon, the son of Amenadav of the tribe of Judah. And his offering was one silver dish whose weight was 130 shekels, one silver bowl of 70 shekels according to the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering. That's for the big altar. One gold pan of ten shekels full of incense for the incense altar. One bull, one ram, one man. We don't need to read the rest. I mean, here the point is it's a gold pan with uh, ten shekels weight full of incense. So 12 tribes bringing their incense in gold pans. Furthermore, we're told that when Nebuchadnezzar robbed the temple, here's what he took. Jeremiah 52, 19. The captain of the guard also took away the bowls, the fire pans, very specific here, basins, pots, lampstands, the pans of the drink offering bowls, what was fine gold and what was fine silver. That applies to the whole list. Gold uh, censers. 2 Chronicles 4, 19 through 22 tells us, Solomon also made all the things that were in the house of God, even the golden altar, the tables with the bread of the presence on them. The lampstands were their lamps of pure gold to burn in front of the inner sanctuary in the way prescribed, the flowers, the lamps, the tongs of gold, of purest gold, and the snuffers, the bowls, the spoons, and the fire pans of pure gold. So fire pans were of gold. So those scholars who hadn't read the details all here, perhaps, or thinking they all had to be bronze to handle the fire are wrong. Obviously, the argument that the word must mean something other than a fire pan is not correct. The thought then is a reference to the golden fire pan, which he took inside the veil rather than the golden altar outside of it. Perhaps a little bit of conjecture, but it makes sense to me. So the thought then, a reference to the fire pan that went inside the veil with him, which would have been quite familiar to all the Jews that he's writing in the diaspora, and perhaps even the Gentiles. You know, we have to remember that when Paul was writing to the Corinthians, 
There was not a, a worse bunch of Christians to write to than the Corinthians. And they were troublemakers and had problems, and he wrote to them and he explained the exodus to them. Paul explained to Gentiles Jewish things. But let's get back to our story. So the main focus for our author was upon the Ark of the Covenant, the most glorious golden pure item in the room, shining from the splendor of the personal presence of God, the Shekinah resting upon the lid. Wherever God is, there's a glory, there's a shining, there's a light, a brilliance. And so that golden top upon that golden ark, no doubt just shone brightly from the presence of God upon it. The holiness of God made that room the holiest place within the camp. The golden character of the ark, you know, the purity, holiness, and glory of God who made his presence rest upon it. Our God's described as he who rests upon the cherubim in several passages of Scripture in the Psalms and Samuel and Chronicles and Isaiah, which I give you a listing without giving you all those verses. Then there are the items connected with or contained in the Ark of the Covenant. He mentions the golden jar full of manna, Aaron's almond rod which budded, the tablets of the Ten Commandments. And nowhere does the Hebrew text of the Torah describe the jar of manna as golden, but the Septuagint does. The uh, Greek Old Testament. Of foremost importance is the Torah, the tablets of the Ten Commandments. That's where our author comes to focus. There was no evidence of an Ark of a Covenant in the Second Temple. None whatsoever. No mention made. No evidence thereof anywhere. Numerous theories about what happened to it. It's down in Ethiopia in a big church down there. It is out by the Dead Sea, hidden by Jeremiah, according to Maccabees. According to Jews, it's underneath the Temple Mount, hidden in a, in a cave cavern underneath there and then walled up. Why did they wall it up? They were scared to touch it. They remembered what happened when David tried to bring that into uh, the city of Jerusalem without it being on the ch shoulders of the priests. And had one gentleman reach out to touch the Ark of the Covenant because the cart was in a rough spot and he was struck dead immediately. So we can't touch that until we get our priests together. And so they walled it up. They saw a box would be about the right size underneath that temple mount. And they said, that's got to be it. They walled it up. Nobody touch it until we get our priests ready to go. And so the Temple Mount Institute, the Temple Mount Faithful, they're all trying to get the priests outlined and sanctified and purified so they can touch it. But they still got to come up with the ashes of red heifer to get there. And they're still working on it. All right, enough, enough of my ranting here. So there are numerous theories what happened. Our author appeals to an earlier time when the Ark of the Covenant was so important in the functioning of the temple worship, particularly for Yom Kippur. It's the prophetic significance of this day of atonement to which our author now comes to focus. The full significance of this day accomplished in Yeshua, our Messiah. So he speaks of the mercy seat, the solid gold top of the Ark of the Covenant with the two cherubim above, above which appeared the presence of our God. And refers to them as the cherubim of glory. The cherubims, the role of the cherubim were to protect the sanctity of the divine space of the glory of God. The cherubim of gold meant to serve a reminder of the truth that the cherubim, uh, God rolled upon, rode upon the cherubim and flew. Uh, when we see them bringing God in and out of the temple in the book of Ezekiel, the cherubim were there to protect that holiness of God's presence. And so a lot of this, we find that there were cherubim who guard the entrance to Gan Eden. Cherubim uh, depicted on the parquet of the first temple to protect the entrance to the glory of God and the Holy of Holies. Some suggest upon the mercy seat, the cherubim ever in vig vig vigilantly, slow down, vigilantly, watched over the place of atonement. That was holy space. The word mercy seat in Greek is hilasterion. The typical translation is propitiation throughout our apostolic writings. So the typical translation, the only other place the exact word is used is Romans 325, hilasterion. Atonement. This is the word used in the Septuagint to translate the Hebrew word kaporet, mercy seat. The Hebrew word translated mercy seat. This is where the blood was sprinkled on the Day of Atonement by the high priest. We've done this already, but let's do it again. Romans 3, 21 through 25. Apart from the Torah, 
the righteousness of God has been made manifest, been manifested, being witnessed by the Torah and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Yeshua, the Messiah, for all those who believe. For there is no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Don't let any modern people tell you the Jews have one way of salvation, Gentiles another. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The only hope for Jews, the same as us, place their faith in Yeshua. Being justified as a gift by his grace of the redemption, which is in Messiah Yeshua, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation, a mercy seat in his blood through faith. Helisterium. So we could say here that God displayed publicly as our mercy seat in his blood through faith. So in Greek as in Hebrew, you've got a number of words based off the base verb and word groups coming from the same basic verb. Helios, helisterion, and helaskomai, and helasmos, all off the same basic uh, Greek term helios, grace, mercy. And so you have these word groups same as in Hebrew, which point to the same basic thought of propitiation for sin. So we find helasmos at 1 John 2, 2 and 4, 10, translate propitiation in New American Standard, helaskamai, at Hebrews 2, 17, uh, which is translated the same sense, propitiation. The basic most important aspect involved in the use of these words is forgiveness of sins, propitiation. Particularly in the Romans passage, you could just as well translate Hilasterion as we've already done, Yeshua, Messiah, our mercy seat. There are two words used in our English translations concerning the forgiveness of sins, this atonement which our author comes to focus upon. They are propitiation and expiation. Uh, they are listed in various paragraphs above where the English words used in the New American Standard. The same word used in three of those referenced in the King James, propitiation except in Hebrews 2.17, where it uses the word reconciliation. And so what's the difference? Well, there's slight differences to reconcile ourselves with a holy God. But it's the same idea. How do we get reconciled to God? We deal with sin. And that's what propitiation is all about. So reconciling a sinful man with a holy God. The word expiation only occurs once in the New American Standard Bible back in Numbers 35.33. So I give this to you both in New American Standard and King James. You shall not pollute the land in which you are, for blood pollutes the land. And no expiation can be made for the land, for the blood that is shed on it, except by the blood of him who shed it. That takes us all the way back to Noah's day. You know, whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. The only way you can deal with it is, you know, shed the blood of that murderer. Numbers 35, 33 for the King James. You shall not pollute the land in which which ye are. For blood it defileth the land, and the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, except or but by the blood of him that shed it. King James. So the same basic idea here. Cleansed, expiate. Cleansed, expiate. Same basic idea. Uh, most of us prefer the simplified, you know, cleansed. But these are technical terms. The Hebrew word here, and Numbers 35, 33 is kafar, from which we get kaporet, or mercy seat. So the basic verb kafar means, uh, old, old Baptist way of thinking of this, old ba I, this is what I heard as a Baptist for 17 years ministry, is they're covered over until Jesus comes. Well, that's not what kafar means. Kafar means to cleanse, to wipe clean, to atone. How do I find that? Looking at what the Jews say the word means. That's where I get that from. I look at Jewish scholarship. So the word expiation is also used in the Jewish publication society of the, this version of the Tanakh, JPS Tanakh. Perhaps the clearest biblical verses of what kafar means is found in Leviticus chapter 16, uh, verses 29 through 30. This shall be a permanent statute for you in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall humble your souls and do no, in, do, uh, not do any work whether the native or the alien who, who sojourns among you, for it is on this day that atonement shall be made for you to cleanse you, kafar. You will be clean, cleansed from all your sins before Adonai. Flat statement in Leviticus, you shall be clean from all your sins before Adonai. King James, and this shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be one of you that sojourneth among you, 
For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before Adonai. So slight different words means exactly the same thing, cleansed from all your sins. So the basic difference between the two words theologically, expiate and propitiate, has to do with what you're doing it to, or who you're doing it to. So expiates the cleansing of the person. Propitiation is reconciling the person to God. Expiate cleans me of the, of the sins or the land of the sins. Propitiate means that I satisfy a holy God with that sacrifice that has been made. And he now uh, is reconciled to me and me to him. So this is the difference between propitiate and expiate. So technical terms can sometimes help us clear things up. We must deal with our sin to have propitiation. We must deal with our sin to have reconciliation with God. We must deal with our sin in order to be saved. You can't be saved without dealing with sin. You cannot be saved without confession of sin. You cannot be saved, be born again without dealing with sin. Unfortunately, we've got many pastors in our modern times who won't use the word sin. We've got many pastors in our modern times who won't deal with the word repent. We've got many pastors in our modern times that won't deal with this idea that the sin that must be dealt with by blood. Don't deal with that. I mean, that's, that's harsh. Well, sure, it's harsh. Sins are harsh. And we have a holy God. So we must deal with sin. Sorry, sometimes I can't teach without preaching or preach without teaching. But, you know, sometimes we just got to deal with it. So the heart of the gospel message is to repent of our sins. Yeshua came saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is among you. Repent, that was his message, repent. John the Baptist's message, repent. Elijah's message, repent. What does that mean? Confess your sins, be sorry for them, and don't go back to them. So con confess, place our faith in Yeshua, our God cleanses us from sin. That's expiation. When we're cleansed and forgiven, reconciled to God, we have a real viable relationship with him. That is propitiation. There is no way in the world that those ancient people with that ancient sacrificial system, did not receive by admitting their sins and their faults, seeking to turn away from them, making a sin offering, and that uh, man taking that sin offering, and especially on the Day of Atonement, going in and sprinkling the blood on that mercy seat, were not forgiven. No way. If, if they could not have been forgiven, if they could not have been cleansed in any way, shape, fashion, or form, then how could Yeshua have ever come there? How could that happen? How could God have let them keep on living in sins that awaited the time of coming of Yeshua? They looked forward to that. It was as if by placing their faith in the system God gave them, it was like Messiah was already present in some sense, the word to cleanse them. So the main point our author is here seeking to impress upon us is the patterns of service in an earthly tabernacle to reveal the pattern of service of Yeshua, our Messiah, in the Holy of Holies in heaven above. Doing the same things in a better place. With his own blood. Because he didn't need the blood of another. He was already sinless and perfect. So let's go on to verses 6 and 7. I've digressed enough. Now when these things have been so prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle to perform the divine worship. But into the second, on the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself... And for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. Yeshua did not have to offer anything for himself. That's what made him a better sacrifice. So rather than the outer tabernacle, the Greek has first again. So he continued in the first, performing the divine worship. Primary focus for our author is the Holy of Holies, the second tabernacle. We're on the high priest enters. Only once a year, not without blood. The main point is to show the ironic priests were to function in such a way to reveal the necessity of a coming high priest the Messiah. The first tabernacle had daily activities every single day. The golden menorah was tended to assure that the seven receptacles kept a flame burning without interruption, Exodus 30, 1 through 9. They attended the burning of the incense morning and evening, morning and evening at the timing of the care of the menorah when the uh, twice daily sacrifice was offered, the Ola, the whole burnt offering of a lamb in the morning, whole burnt offering of the lamb at evening. So the lambs were being offered, the menorah was being tended, the incense was being burned twice a day, every day, so that you could actually use the place 
and eventually get into that place where God is. So once a week, they put out the showbread upon the golden table for that presentation on the Shabbat. So daily and weekly activities in the first tabernacle by many priests. And to the second, on the high priest center, only once a year on Yom Kippur. Day of Atonement, Yom HaKippurim, the tenth day of the seventh month. We must know that while this duty was solely his responsibility, no one else could do it, only the high priest, he could not enter there on the basis of his own holiness. For he was just like the rest of them, he was sinful. He had to be forgiven just like the rest of them. He had to offer a sacrifice just like the rest of them. So he took a blood of a bull, went in to make sacrifice for himself and sacrifice for all the priests, then a blood of a goat to make sacrifice for the people. And he came out and confessed the sins of the people over the head of the scapegoat and took that goat where? Away from Jerusalem, outside of the city, outside of the territory, out in the wilderness, where it would never come back. As far as east is from the west, so far he's removed our sins from us. We could go to Psalm 32, Psalm 51, both Psalms written by King David after his sin with Bathsheba, when he says, hide not thyself from me, cleanse me, do not take your spirit from me, but cleanse me and make me whole again, and fill me with your spirit that I might teach transgressors your way. David was forgiven. Some of the most heinous crimes that assail us today in our own modern world. But he was forgiven of those. So we must know, coming back to our text, that this duty was solely his, but he had to make sacrifice for himself. Yeshua did not. He had to enter with the blood of an innocent animal to sacrifice for himself and appointed the need of an innocent to die for the guilty. That's the common thread. The innocent must die for the guilty. The coin of Gadol entered in on the basis of the life of someone else. That was to give us the indication that it's going to be on the basis of the life of someone else in order for me to deal with my sins. And that someone else was Yeshua, the Lamb, as John said when he saw him coming to be immersed in the Yarden, the Jordan River. Behold the Lamb, which takes away the sin of the world. And so, again from Tim Haig, now the picture becomes more and more clear. The yearly cycle in the life of the covenant people of Israel clearly mapped out in the Torah. God gave a map how to live your life, day by day, month by month, year by year. The years were to be counted, each seventh year, sabbatical year. Then the sabbatical years were counted to come to the Jubilee, the Yovel. The 50th year fall in the seven sabbatical years. The cycle of the year in the Israelite society, therefore the primary unit of time, and function as a mini picture of the whole. A whole year pictures coming to the Jubilee, which pictures the coming of the final end when everything's restored and refreshed back to what God intended it to be to begin with. So each year the cycle would begin again with the Torah festivals repeated each year. And in the cycle of the year, only once does the high priest enter into the inner sanctuary to make atonement on the Ark of the Covenant. One time, one priest, once in the complete yearly cycle. For our author, it speaks of the once for all time of Yeshua that would offer himself as the atoning sacrifice and payment for the sins of all who would be saved. I couldn't improve on the way he said it, so I figured I'd just let him say it. You know, it just gives us a picture, a map. Our Lord Yeshua the Messiah needed no other sacrifice, for he himself was pure, sinless, and perfect. Therefore, what he accomplished was a once-for-all event that would not need to be repeated. But saves to the uttermost those who place their faith in him. It's emphasized both in this chapter and in the next. Hebrews 9, 11, and 12, which we're not going to get that far tonight or today. When Messiah appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater, more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. If we are saved, we are eternally saved. Praise his name. Hebrews 10.10 10 says, By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Yeshua the Messiah once for all time. Once forever, once for all. And so this is what our, our Bible says, once for all. I don't know how else to understand that. The ultimate goal of the Torah and the whole sacrificial system is Messiah Yeshua, who willingly laid down his life for us according to the plan of God. 
This was the ultimate purpose of the sacrifices, to point out the necessity of the innocent dying for the guilty. And as he was able in his death, you remember what happened in his death? Parochet, second veil ripped from top to bottom to indicate access into the holiness of God, the presence of God on this earth, which apparently wasn't in there in the second temple period. But God was still with his people, and we have access to him. That was the point of the picture that was given to us there. So this ultimate purpose of the sacrifices. One who would not need to suffer, offer sacrifices for himself, but in, self, in and of himself, pure, holy, and sinless. And so we used Isaiah 53 this morning. I felt like this is the best way to end today. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, spent of God, and afflicted. If we were to see him after he had been flogged and carrying that wooden stake or that cross member of it out to Golgotha, we would think, my goodness, we put our hope in something that is impossible. In fact, he stumbled and they had to get Simon Cyrene to carry the, that cross beam out there for him. So we would have looked at him and esteem him stricken, stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But out of eyes caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. So praise his holy name. And so this is the point that he's getting us to here in the book of Hebrews. Well, all right. I did that quicker than I thought I would. See what questions or comments you guys may have. Yes. Rodney first. I always, when you start that way, I always wonder, where are we going here? Rabbi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I would say yes, and I would say yes on the basis of what Yeshua said to the Sadducees. He said to the Sadducees, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. So they were already in that Lamb's Book of Life, and they had life. Yes. Blameless would be a better term. They had to do it again every single year. Why? Because it could not make us perfect. Uh, it could deal with that sin for that year. Then we had to deal with the next year's sins in that year. And the following year's sins in that year. What Yeshua does for us is to cleanse us in a more complete, full, and holy way and write the Torah on our hearts with that new covenant in order that we don't sin again. That's something they couldn't do. He was a righteous and good man. He was living as blameless a life as he could, yeah. You must be born again. Right.
No. No. Robot. Yes. Yes. Amen. It's looking forward. No. And so did David have to be born again. And he had to believe. He had to understand. And so he wrote the passages we're dealing with in this whole study of Hebrews. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make the earth a footstool for your feet. I deal with your enemies and I put you on that throne. And so David saw that in the scripture and he gave his heart to follow after God. He was a man after God's own heart. As righteousness, yes. Yes, and he looked forward and saw Messiah's day, believed. And you have Jacob who wrestled with Yeshua. And, you know, he became a part of God. Did that make him sinless the rest of his life? No. Yes, Keith. Yes. Yeah, that's when we get into chapter 10. No. And we don't have to go back for another sacrifice. He is our sacrifice, and that blood is still efficacious for us. It's still effective for us. And we come because if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from that unrighteousness if we sin after we've been saved. But he deals with all that sin before we placed our faith in Yeshua. And he's given to us an ability to not turn back to sin. Sin shall no longer have dominion over you, Romans chapter 6. Yes, right. Turning back to it, yes. Our tome is complete. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen, Brett. From the sin nature, right. The original sin, the sin nature, right. He could transform us. Remember, one of the words that he used in all this, if we can go back, until the time of reformation. So what Yeshua does is reform the human heart. The Jeremiah passage we looked at last week, uh, the new covenant, I'm going to take out that heart of flesh. I'm going to give you a heart of stone. I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. I'm going to put my spirit in you, and I'm going to write that Torah on your heart. That's the difference those priests could not uh, accomplish. But David was truly forgiven and cleansed of that sin. So he continued being that man that God called and do what God gave him to do in writing so much beautiful passage of Scripture for us throughout the Psalms. Yes. <laughs> I know. No, 
he didn't. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Same reason that, that James Meacham doesn't have to see to be able to pull a trigger and take a deer, to ride a horse, pull a gun, hit a balloon. You learn where things are. You can find your way in your house being blind as a bat because you know where things are. You open that parakeet, it's straight in front of you. So you open that parakeet, you put that incense down, you sprinkle the blood straight in front of you. And it's going to hit that Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. I mean, that Ark of the Covenant filled that holy place, that holy of holies. No. I know, 10 cubits by 10 cubits. 10 by 10 by 10. So it was tight. It's just big enough for the ark and the th things go with it. So when you part of that parakeet enough to go in and put that incense down, all you had to do was go straight ahead, sprinkle the blood. So you had that little uh, sensor. You had this golden goblet with the blood in it. And you keep it moving so it don't coagulate and you sprinkle it and you come back out. Correct, yes. They did. Constant cleansing. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Yes. We're not there yet. <laughs> not the way you should, does it now? He takes away the sin nature. He takes away the desire. He takes away that part of us that only looks to ourselves. And he places something fresh and new in us with the Holy Spirit. And he cleanses us from that sin nature itself. That's the point of being saved. Yeah. You can say the inclination to sin. Yes, sir, Chris. The Torah can never make perfect. That's Hebrews 10, 2. The Torah cannot make perfect. That atonement did not make perfect. What Yeshua does makes perfect. He was perfect sacrifice. He makes us perfect. We're in the process of being perfected. That's sanctification. That's what I say. Now, Yeshua, when he died, his blood sprinkled one time is good for me, even if I sin on my last day of life on this earth. I don't have to have another sprinkle. That sprinkle is done. It's good for me forever. Yes. Yes. That's what we're just saying. Yes. Continual process. And that's the main point of our author. It's no longer continual process. It's done once for all. Yes, Marta. Yes, there'll be sacrifices. As a remembrance of what he did for us. Yes. Everybody wants to spiritualize that, but what do you replace it with? It's very clearly stated in the book of Ezekiel, also in Isaiah, that there will be animal sacrifices made again. And he'll be the one doing them, the prince. 
Yeah. Same reason we've got a photo album of home. Because the only connection I have with my grandparents is look at pictures. Or my mom and dad to look at pictures and memorializes what he did for us. Absolutely. People born in the millennium will need to know too. Yes. Very good point. Absolutely. People born in the millennium will have to understand that truth from the sacrifices. Yeah. Yes, Ernest. Yes. Right. Right. Amen. Amen. And one of the strangest, most interesting things about our apostolic writings of the New Testament is after, and you've got that new messianic work begun, Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost, after Paul has been saved on that Damascus road, after, until that temple was destroyed, we find Peter and John and Paul going to the temple, making sacrifices, even though Messiah has already come, and died for them, and they've experienced that new birth. But they're still going to the temple and doing sacrifices. Why? Because God gave us a pattern that gives us worship of him and understanding what he did for us and Messiah. So they continue to go do it. And so that gives us a, a hint of why, you know, there's going to return to that in the future because it all centers about what God does. And he gave us a, a pattern that we shall continue. did and it does and that's why they got Roman permission to create a school at Yavne north of, of uh, Tel Aviv there in those after days about AD 75 or something like that or 80s up through the 90s and they founded a school and they, they sat down and all the rabbis the Jews that were left uh, began to deliberate how now shall we serve God and so how, how do they do that? And that's when they began developing the Mishnah, written down about A.D. 200, and then the Talmud put together about A.D. 600. But that came out of all that deliberating, now how, how can we live life for God without a temple? And so that's how all that developed. I said, trying to figure it out. And so there's a passage in, in the Psalms that says, um, how shall we worship God? Now, the praise of our lips giving glory to God. And so this is how they do it. You know, prayers and good deeds. Be a good person. Do good. Change the world with your good life. Tikkun. Change the world. Make it a better place. So it is. It's a dilemma for them, and then it's a dilemma for the church, too, in a different way. <laughs> it's a big dilemma. So there are those who will teach us that's all symbolic. Explain the symbol to me. How do, how do you bring over the detail of Ezekiel with the sacrificial system that it re recounts for us? How do, you, how do you symbolize that? What do you make that out to be? I just, I don't see that personally.
Well, that's true, and a lot of them that uh, do teach repentance and are soul winners, they still don't teach the whole Bible. You know, they focus on get saved. Get saved, get right, Lord, you come at any time. But if we really believe what we say we teach here at Havar Shalom, he's going to follow the pattern. He gave us a yearly pattern with these festivals. And the festival that's going to pinpoint that coming is going to be Yom Teruah. And the judgment on the earth is going to be Yom Kippur. And the final gathering of the people together is going to be Sukkot. If, if he did the first three in a, an agreement with a pattern, then he'll do the next sets with a pattern as well. And so it's going to have to agree with that. Otherwise, we need to stop back up and restudy and do something different than what we're doing. It's got to fit a pattern that he's given to us. Hmm? So, you know, that's why I teach it's going to be at Yom Teruah. Well, here they're having a show far, and that's when the rapture will occur. Books are open, books are closed. That's Yom Kippur. Amen. Ten days of all, the ten days of getting right with God and make sure that we're right with God before that judgment hits because once the judgment hits, it's too late. Once the wars come, it's too late. Uh, Jeremiah's even telling the, the city of J Jerusalem that in the book of Jeremiah. Once, the ne once Nebuchadnezzar takes his city, it's going to be too late. Get right with him now. And so when that judgment falls, it's too late. That judgment's coming. Well, all right, we've gone a little past time, so if you would, we'll stand and we'll conclude with the Iranic benediction and say the homotzi. Ivarekika Adonai Vayishmoreka Yare Adonai Panavaleka Vichuneka Yis Adonai Panavaleka Vayasem Lecha Ah, shalom. May Adonai bless you and keep you. May Adonai make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May Adonai lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Bashim Yeshua HaMashiach, Sar Shalom, in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Amen. And Shabbat Shalom. And we'll say the Hamotzi. Baruch Atai Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaMalam, Hamotzi Lechem Min Haaretz. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth.